pretty good. So what's going on here? What's actually happening? We talk about all these sophisticated super systems of data and data processing. Turns out every single one of you is one of these data systems. Why are you a data product? Because your eyes take in observations. They see all this information coming in. Then your brain has to process it. And that moment where you're thinking like, did it just really do that? That little aha moment, that's when it's proving to you that you suck as a data product. <laughs> right? That surprise, you're like, oh shit, no. Right? And so now, if all this is happening, and this is only with four variables, how are you supposed to use data in your daily life to operate your business? Right? Especially when we just show that we're not very good at this. What, how do we do this? So it actually turns out I have two, two really important lessons. Two really important lessons is this actually, this is a double pendulum. This is one of the first double pendulums used to prove something called chaos theory, that a small effect can cause a giant effect somewhere else. And so the idea here with this is you can actually control these systems. You can control this chaotic system. And the way to control these systems is that you actually have to have two really important things. And this is the, one of the most important things that we've learned in data and data science and the internet. It kind of says of all these things. Two really important things. First, you have to have really, really high speed observations. High speed, high quality observations. Your data has to come in really fast. Now, how do I, and, and then the second part of that is you have to have the ability to make control happen really quickly. You have to have the ability to do very small control, but very, very fast. So, how do you get a sense of that? Anyone ever try to play this game with a broomstick where you balance it? Right? What happens when you try to do it if it's if it gets a little away from you? It's really hard, right? You lose it right away. You ever try to do this game drunk? Like homework. <laughs> but no, what happens is you have latency. You have latency. Your eye and eye coordination is slow. So you can't actually control it as fast. Same exact problem if you're trying to control a chaotic system like this. You can't do it because you don't have that high speed control. How about the observation? Try to do it in a dark room where you can't see anything. Try to do it with a strobe light. It's really, really hard. So if you're gonna do anything with data, and everyone is doing it these days, you have to have this high-speed observations and high-speed control. And so that's the stuff I'm gonna talk about, which is how do we actually make that happen? It's so easy to say that, but it's like, what the hell does that mean when you try to put that actually into business? And so that's the part where data is that, what is data science? When everyone uses these words like big data, and data science, and all this thing, this is what you have to take away from it. Number one, a data-driven organization. Think about it as a data-driven organization rather than just using data. You're an organization that uses data to process, to take in information, and then use that information in a way that is fast. You're using it to be fast to create efficiency, to iterate on your business practices, develop new products. And why are you doing that? To navigate the competitive landscape. That's the goal. You're using data for that end of a need. And why, why, is that, why is that really a big, par big paradigm shift? It's because of the speed at which we can do analytics these days, than before. Whether it's a small business, big business, LinkedIn, Google, government, you know, a small mom and pop shop, they're all able to do it much faster. I'll give you an example of this. This is a little graph. How many people know that as a Priceline guy? This is like the, this is like the generational test, <laughs> right? No, this is Kirk. Let's just be clear. Right? It's Kirk, and this is that famous scene where he's sitting there, he's saying, "Con." And so, what this person did is they said, "You know, on the bottom here, we're going to ask how many A's there are in Con, and we're going to see how many times Google has a result for that many A's." And so, of course, there's this, there's a lot of A's, what a lot of there's a lot of you know millions of these things where there's this K H A N. And then there's a lot more that just kind of drops off in the ad age in between. But what happens in here, it starts to get interesting because if you look down at 81 and there's a spike, just think about it. Who in the right mind put 81 A's <laughs> in common, right? You have to be really dedicated to do that. And it's not just one, it's 100 people. There's 100 of these people doing it. So now, is that a fluke or is there something interesting there? We now have a graph that can tell us, hey, that's weird. Let's go look at that. Let's understand if something new is happening. Is there a new environmental shift? Is the landscape changing? 
Is there something new that we should be able to? Is the world we're changing in happening in a different way? Is that chaos starting to take over? And the crazy thing is, five years ago, 10 years ago, to do this, this would have been thousands of dollars, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars depending on the size of your company. Why? Because you gotta go buy a database. Then you gotta buy something like an ETL system, an extract load system, to control it. Then you need a bunch of headcount to do it. Then you need some contractors. And then you need a visualization software. And before you've done it, you're in paperwork hell. Right? But what happens here is this nowadays is literally an interview question. If you came and interviewed for my team at LinkedIn, this you we would expect you to accomplish in 45 minutes to get this graph and not get blocked by Google at the same time. You spin up something on Amazon, you get a bunch of data in, you, you write the quick crawlers off some open source software, you just put it into your favorite plotting system that's open source, and you're good to go. And you should be able to tell a story about it. Why is it interesting? It's 45 minutes of work nowadays versus weeks, months before. And that's the crazy thing, is that speed at which is happening. And so what the thing is, is how does this actually break down into the way people are using data science these days? It's really these functional areas. And that functional area first starts off with one of the, the most important areas, which we call decision sciences and business intelligence. These are the guys who understand the user, the usage, they build, they build reports, dashboards, they do special analysis, they do testing. This idea of A-B testing, but you may also, on the web it says like, hey, is the button green or red, does it work better? But it might be advertisement A versus advertisement B, publishing in this uh, newspaper versus this newspaper. All of these things, these are the key whiz kids who help figure this out. When you hear about like the latest campaigns and they're employing the data scientists to do all this crazy stuff during the election, that's these guys. That's what these guys specialize in. And so if you think about the modern day CEO, What's a modern day CEO do, right? I don't always make decisions, but when I do, I use data. That's a modern day CEO now. They're all asking for where's their data person. And so I think it's a good analogy to think about when you're asking about what is a really good CEO do, it's asking who the world's greatest CEO is. And that, of course, is Kirk. <laughs> why, is, why is Kirk the greatest CEO? Right, because every day he can save the world in 45 minutes, right? And, uh, and, but he has something very unique. He has the world's greatest data scientist, right? And because, and most importantly, the data person's on the bridge. And this is one of the big shifts that's happening. Most of the time, traditionally, you go into a company, they go into a boardroom, and they try to make a decision, and somebody says, hey, we need some data. They say, yeah, you know what, that's right. So they go back down into the bowels of the company and say, hey, we need to pull some data. And the person, the data guy is saying, it's not the data you want. Give me the data. And they go back and they go to the meeting, and the person says, You know, this data's not this really very good data. It's not helping us. And you go back and forth and back and forth, back and forth. The equivalent of that is if you're on the bridge of the, of the spaceship and the day where the, there's the Romulans and the Klingons, it's gotten really bad. And, you know, that would fly because you got seconds to make a decision. And if you think this is just sort of like science, sci fi kind of gobbledygook, go look at Northcom, go look at Stratcom. Look at any of the places now where you have very serious deployments in the military. There's a data guy right there on the bridge, the equivalent. And they earn their spot. Why? Why is this so different? Because the data person has context. They actually understand the business. They're not just some egghead that's sitting in the back. They're a person who actually understands the business and the fundamentals of it and how to use the data in a very important role, which is the storytelling. They're trying to figure out what the narrative is and how to take action because they're trying to make it a data-driven organization. And so with that, one of the most important things that these guys create is a dashboard. And so everyone's looked at a dashboard this morning, but let's be honest, when you look at a dashboard, what do you think? And it's, it's kind of epitomizing this cartoon here, it says, you know, you need a dashboard application to track your key metrics. That way you'll have more data to ignore when you make decisions based on company politics. <laughs> will, will the data be accurate? Okay, let's pretend that matters. <laughs> Somebody's like, oh, that was, that was my conference call about 30 minutes ago. <laughs> right, that's a dashboard. That's, a da that's how we create dashboards. But let's be honest with what our, when we look at our dashboard today, what, what do our dashboards look like? It looks, our dashboards look like something our kids use Crayola pens to draw. Right? They got this awful thing and they got pie charts 
they, they look terrible. They, they're not actionable. But then, you know what? People try to make them, let's make them 3D. Because 3D will help us figure out what we're supposed to do. Uh, and, and, so, you know what? If we put the logo of what we're working on, that'll help us think about it in context. So, oh, you know what? Black is sexy. You know, the data looks thinner if it's in black. Great. You know, here's a face. This is, this is like, this is the great part. You got like this pie chart here where it's like, I wonder if that improved or not. <laughs> it's like measuring pixels. But the thing is, adding more page, more data to a page, so hoping it makes it actionable, is just false. It, in fact, we have a word for it. We call it data vomit. <laughs> it's like, great, you just put up a whole more, much more data. So what? Yeah, the thing is that you have to do is you have to think of the dashboard as a product. It has to be something that you would be proud to present to somebody. Why? Why is that? We actually know that if you make the dashboard really, really great, really nice to look at, it helps you understand what's happening, people actually spend a lot more time in the business looking at it. In fact, if you go to a place, a company like Square, which is a payment processor, they have dashboards all over the company, and they brought in visual specialists whose job it is to only think about those dashboards from a perspective of data science. That's all they did. And as a result, people started to look at the dashboards and kind of go, wow, wait, what does that mean? Why are the 8180s happening here? We should go investigate that. And so as a result, everyone in the company started to take responsibility of the data and take ownership of solving problems before management has to start asking about it. And this is one of the big fundamental shifts that's happened for Silicon Valley is this idea of democratizing the data. Everyone has access to it. It's a little uncomfortable at first, but when everyone has access to it, suddenly everyone can ask questions and get interesting insights, come up with hypotheses. Everyone starts to have context about the business. And when something goes wrong, they're in position to take action, to start solving it. And that gives us the agility to stay on the, the competitive edge. And so here's a couple of rules for building uh, data as a product, and we were just talking a little bit about this. And one of the first rules, if you're gonna build a dashboard, ask yourself the zero overhead principle. And so the zero overhead principle, this comes out of when we're building software for, the, for uh, analysts who are working on counterterrorism things, and these guys get tons and tons of data, and so we bring in these people who build this special software and we say, great, this looks good, let's, uh, let's get some analysts up on it, and they say, great, it's only gonna take them a week of training. Like, a week of training? Holy cow, that's insane. Because think about today. Think about, anybody buy an iPhone recently? iPad or an Android? How many, did it come with a manual? No, it comes with four pieces of paper primarily for to make sure that you don't sue them. I remember the days when you buy like, like an old software from like a PC and it'd be like, here's your stack of books. It used to make you feel like you got your value out of it. No, not anymore. My son can kick the crap out of me in Angry Birds, and he does it legally. <laughs> How does that happen? The software teaches you. The software should always teach you what to do. So the same way, when you have a dashboard, there's a lot of times there's numbers against some word. What does that word mean? Why don't you have a glossary there? How come there's not an example, a case study, those type of things? And so if you're gonna put data out there, Make sure there's a zero overhead principle to do it. Why is that so important? Because data can oftentimes be intimidating. And those that with data can make it intimidating. And the job of the data people is to say, hey, you know what, zero overhead principle. If somebody who is not mathematically inclined is having trouble here, we're failing. We're failing this rule. So we have to make sure everybody understands what this means. And so oftentimes we actually sit down and we say, all right, anybody can have any questions what these metrics even mean? Just basic definitions. Is it a rolling average? Is it five day average? Like, what does this mean? Like, what, what is it up good or is it up down good? Like, what is it? We ask all those questions. Second part, we ask ourselves these three fundamental questions whenever we're working with data. What do you want me to take away with this? Like, what's, what am I, things good, bad? What am I supposed to do? What action do you want me to take? Should I call somebody? Should I do something right now? And the third is, how do you want me to feel? What, how, how should I feel? Should I feel happy? Should I feel, should I feel you know, nervous? Things good, bad? This turned out 
If you apply this to your dashboard today, if you apply this to anything that you provide in the company with any type of measurement, you will get very different responses from people and you realize, oh crap, we better go fix this. And it's one of the easiest ways to start getting people to pay attention to the data. From that, how do you deal with the office politics of data? You know, one person says, yes, that is good. The other person's like, no, I have my chart. It says you suck. <laughs> but we start by saying, asking the question, so when people bring data in, we say, does everyone understand it? We first want to have a conversation at level set. At LinkedIn, we used to call this SSR. Remember that at, in like elementary school? Silent, sustained reading. We used to have silent, sustained. We used to actually translate it to sit down, shut up, and read. There was a lot of politics around it. So like, everyone, sit down, shut up, and read. But, but you can ask any clarifying question. Like, I just don't understand how you guys calculate this. What does this mean? Because oftentimes, one graph goes up, one graph goes down. People are like, wait, we're asking the same question. We start digging in, we realize, no, you're actually asking two different questions, both of which are important. And as a result, we are that much smarter now. We're that much smarter and better off because we ask that. And that, so as a result of that, we use that to diffuse the question of any time people use data as a weapon. And then part of that is, is that data works best when it's a conversation. It's not something that's just emailed out or kind of just posted. You have to have conversations. So most of these companies are now starting what they call metrics meetings. So they'll carve out an hour and the CEO, the CFO, the head of data, the head of whoever operations, all these different things. All these people are in the room talking about data. In fact, it's a, usually it's one of the most intense meetings at LinkedIn, Facebook, even the company where I'm at now, or Late IQ. It's one of the some of the most intense stuff because everyone's talking about like what they're trying to understand. Why are we trying to understand so so aggressively? Because we're trying to be a data-driven organization because we don't know what's coming around the corner, and we're using data to iterate and make ourselves more effective. And one of the most important things here is don't be afraid to look up. There's a really important time to ignore the data. If you don't believe me, just type in to, G, to Google GPS and cliff and see how many people actually drive off cliffs because they got, they're just paying attention. And think about that for that moment. So you're driving along in a car, you know, top down, it's great, Grand Canyon, something like that. It's awesome. And the little voice is like, turn right. And you're like, turn right. There's a cliff. It's like, turn right. Turn, okay. You listen to a three and a half inch screen that was lecturing you and you ignored reality. It happens all the time. More scarily, it happens all the time in business. Your gut, you're, we're human for a reason. There are times to ignore the data. There are times where the data can also help you course correct. So know, always have this data skeptical mind. Ask yourself, is this a good time to ignore the data? Use your gut, use your wisdom in your business to ask if when you should ignore it. Second area, we're seeing a ton of this now. Uh, in security, fraud and abuse security. Uh, the best data, the best security teams are now actually built out of data teams. Why? Who's going to find the signal out of the noise? You're searching for this kind of crazy thing. And the hackers, they're, they are good. They are, they are getting better every minute of every hour. You know, give me an example. This is my LinkedIn profile. And you can actually, this is a, this is a map of all my connections. You can actually get your own. And, and uh, if you type in in map, I N M A P S, and LinkedIn. And what it shows here is the orange is, is people I've worked with, and uh, uh, that's actually LinkedIn. And uh, blue is Silicon Valley, red is the data scientists, green is eBay, government up in the uh, red, or I think silver is my white social network. But it's the best. It's kind of yucky. Here's the cool thing. If you looked at a fraudulent map of, of transactions, or someone created a fake one, you can't fake this messiness. It would look super clean, it would look super pristine. And so what we do is we look for messiness. We use a map as the data to say, hey, is this messy enough? It's too clean. We're like, uh-oh, there's a problem there. And so now banks, counterterrorism, everyone looks for this messiness. That's what they're looking for. And so a little twist on data can give you a big leg up to understand Someone's taking advantage of your business, and this is this is this is true even inside businesses. By the way, one of the best ways to identify collusion is through these network graphs. It's super easy, super fast. That infrastructure. I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time. Like it's the questions I'm happy to talk about it. But these are people, and there's because there's these are the people who own the infrastructure to move that around. 
And it depends on the scale of which your data. The only thing I want to emphasize to you is if you are an owner of a business, is to remember this toolbox principle. When you're building out data systems or the technology, most times people say, we want one system. You can have only one system. That's equivalent of calling the plumber up or the plumber talking to you when this, you know, the sink's broken and it's Sunday night and you, you know, like get over here and he's like, well, what, which tool do you want me to bring over? You're like, I want all the tools and your friend's tools and I want the thing fixed and whatever it takes. So get, get out of the mentality of saying one tool. Ask what are the right tools? Is there a cost of having more than one tool? Yes. But if you're going to start moving towards this edge of data, you have to have more than one technology to support it. <laughs> Just to give you an example, at the very early days of LinkedIn itself, these are a number of the technologies that were used. Many of these technologies overlap massively, and some we even had to invent on our own. Not because we just wanted to, but because we finally got to a place where we realized that all the other technologies just would no longer work for us. We just couldn't use them. So we had to come up with our own thing. One of my favorite areas of data science is I think where some of the most innovation is happening right now is what you can do with product marketing and sales and all the really cool stuff. And so to give you an example of that, anybody ever seen these kind of little pop-ups on LinkedIn, Facebook, that people you may know? Yeah? Sometimes those people are like, whoa, that's a little creepy. How do you guys figure that out? <laughs> so this system, I want to tell you the story of this real quick. This system was created by this guy named Jonathan Goldman. And Jonathan, in the early days of LinkedIn, he had this idea. He said, hey, you know what? When you get to LinkedIn for the first time, how is anybody supposed to know who's here? And they're like, oh, there's a search box here. But who do you, whose name do you type first in search? Like, I don't know who I type. You know, if I ask you right now, pick a name to type in the, in the, just now, you wouldn't know. You'd actually stop. And if you ask a user in front of a computer and say, pick a name, they're like, uh, they stall. If you said, pick a name with A, then they can go faster. But it's really hard. So he said, shouldn't we tell people who are actually already on the system? That makes sense. And the analogy here is the first time when you get into a group of people, like you're in the lobby for the first time at this event, and you, 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 know, you're, you're, you don't necessarily know everybody, you kind of feel that awkward feeling. And then you kind of find after a while, you see a people you know, or you get comfortable with people, and you start to feel, you feel, start to feel more comfortable in the space. These social systems are designed, they only work when you feel comfortable. So we realize, like, hey, we have to make people feel comfortable. And the way to make people comfortable is for people to understand that their people are here. They are in the room. And it's virtual, so you can't actually see them. So he said, hey, guys, we need to build this people we know functionality. And everyone said, that's, that seems like an interesting idea, but we got all these other things we got to build. We need to build all this other stuff. So they said, that's great. So Jonathan, like a good data scientist, said, yeah, I'm just going to go build it anyway. So he went, and he, and he just went and started to build this. And did he use any whiz bang kind of super kind of crazy algorithms or anything like that? No. He asked three very simple questions. He said, same questions, by the way, that you probably ask when you meet anybody for the first time. So where do you work? Where do you go to school? And then finally, triangle closing. Hey, how'd you get here? Oh, you know Tom? I know Tom, too. Oh my gosh, how do you, that Tom guy, right? <laughs> That's all he asked, triangle closing, those three things. And then what he did is he built an ad. He built an ad with these three recommendations in it. And so if you clicked on it and you came back to the site a bunch of times, you'd finally see the whole ad again. He didn't care. And he put it on the site. And then everyone came in one morning and they're like, what the hell is going on? Oh my gosh, the site is exploding. We've never seen this kind of usage. Did anybody change anything? Uh, I released this app. I'm like, what's on that app? It was this. And within weeks, the entire social networking space, MySpace, Facebook, Friendster, everyone, all the dead ones, all the living ones, they all, within weeks, implemented this. The power here is one guy, one person, with access to the data, was able to transform the way billions of people interact online by just coming up with that. That's literally the app, that's what happened. And it's not just an isolated example. This happens all the time now, where we're seeing these transformations when somebody has access to a little bit of data. They can be clever. They don't have to be smart. Clever trumps smart in this game. Give me some examples of also how people are using data. One of the ones that we've seen 
where I think it's highly applicable to everyone here, is also how people are using data in terms of advertising and journalism. This is one that we put in with the uh, uh, Wall Street Journal. They said, hey, how's uh, this ninjas? It's weird. People are calling themselves ninjas. Why, why would they call themselves ninjas? It's just, I don't know. That makes no sense to us. So we did a little bit of a push, and we said, you know what? Oh, whoa, ninjas are gross. Holy cow. <laughs> these people, who are these people? He said, oh, well, who, who aren't they? So he said, oh, well, okay, there's evangelists, but don't be a guru. So we, we put this together. Total time it took to put this together? An hour or two, not very long. What did it get us? Got us the homepage of wallstreetjournal.com. Got us the front page of the Wall Street Journal. How much did we pay in advertising? Zero. This was a time at LinkedIn where people were like, what's LinkedIn? Why is this interesting? They just sent me a lot of email. <laughs> right? This was a time we couldn't get we couldn't get anybody to care. We're talking like a, just a few million users. And all of a sudden we're on the homepage of all these properties. In context, so everyone suddenly cares. Usage spiked. And that's the classic paradigm that we're seeing. And people are using this all over the place nowadays in all sorts of formats. This is one we did where we said, hey, where are people going after the crash of the financial industry? Which industries are going to? Was this any super crazy whiz bang visual graphics? You know what this is created in? No, not even worse even. PowerPoint. <laughs> you know how it came up? We'd spend like a little while and we're like, oh, well, I wonder where everyone goes. And so, and guess what our very super sophisticated technology to, uh, to understand the data was? Excel. <laughs> like people were like, people time they were like, oh my gosh, you must have super computers. We're like, yes. <laughs> For our laptops, we do Excel. <laughs> and then we put the, and then we, we wrote the blog post and we're like, you know, it's just a bunch of words. We need an image. So we put an image, so we kind of whipped this thing together. We had a guy who was super crazy, PowerPoint skills. They put this together, and then we had people who wrote in and they said, I'm not sure about Barclay versus Credit Suisse because I measured the number of pixels of Barclay to Credit Suisse, and that can't be right. They're looking at the economic data I pulled, and we're like, wow. <laughs> it's just directionally correct. But it got, it became, we became the talk. And that's the difference between what we're seeing in advertising with all these ideas of lead gen and all these things now. Lead gen, by the way, the things that perform the best are all things that have data in it. Where data isn't just like, look, here's a table or some graph thing. It tells a story. It tells a narrative. Those are the things that go viral. Those are things that stick in a way that nothing else can. And particularly where if you have the spectrum of, of, of anything that you, like you do in franchises, you have phenomenal, I mean, phenomenal ability to leverage this problem in ways to craft the media conversation for you. To frame the debate. To engage with your users, your customers, everything in very unique ways. You know, it goes on with how people are using data these days. You go to Walmart, you go to Amazon, you kind of see these kind of things, you know, now you know what I was shopping for. And, and you get these things like, oh great, betting sheet. But then what's the first thing you do? When you look at one of these things? Comparison shop. How do you comparison shop? Oh wow, you do that? That's just very sophisticated. Most people, what they do is they just look at this little line. <laughs> right? People who bought this also bought this. Right? But why, you know why they built that? It's because people were getting, doing, trying to do the comparison shopping, but it's too much. It was too much heavy lifting. So they said, hey, you know, we want to give you browse capability. We want to give you a sense of all the other things that are there. And this, by the way, this thing, if you, want, if you want to talk numbers, typically when you put in this browse kind of situation where you're not asking people to create, but just to browse, you're going to see 8 to 20, 23-ish, probably percent lift on a page. Right away. Right away. Super easy to get that kind of lift. That stickiness that happens. And what's interesting is users who are normally adverse to seeing a number are now saying, you know, this isn't good enough. This is not acceptable. We need to have percents on this. We want to know what, what actual percents mean. That's, think about that. For populations that are using Walmart on the scale Walmart is, where they demand a percent, that's 
That's astonishing. But that's the direction the world is headed. That's the demand that's happening. And it's showing no sign of abatement. One of the other things that we're seeing is with email, and the way people engage with email in conversation with data. And so this is one that's is an email that was present, that's now pretty regular. It says, 2010 was a year of change, 363 of your LinkedIn connections, started something new. There's a few of them, and it gets, it says, hey, here's Patrick's new job, it's all the case, where's Nathan, where's Ellen? Anybody get this? Yeah? So this email, I contend, has the highest click-through and open rate of any email out there that doesn't use naked people. <laughs> like, and, and you think about that, you say, it's like, why is that? You're like, Patrick, how the hell did Patrick get a new job? Like, I have 10 Patricks. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, Ellen? How, Ellen's got a new job. I'm like, Ellen is, wow, she's one of my best friends. How could this happen? This is ridiculous. This is the kind of email that gets many, many clicks. It doesn't get like some small percent of things. These are like, these are blowout numbers. When you put an email out like this, everyone says nowadays, like when you get this type of email, this is the type of email that people say, make sure your servers are ready for capacity. And not only that, people love these emails. They, most email people are like, oh, another email. This is the email people are like, yeah, awesome. I, I want to know. That's, people want the synopsis. And so we're seeing this very different way of engaging with the customer. By the way, how, you know how long this took? for someone to do. This was two people, one designer, one data scientist, in just a few hours as well. A couple days, actually, by the time it was really done. That's it. Nothing super crazy. Nothing super sophisticated. Clever. Not smart. Clever. Uh, but one thing I do want to caution you of is that data can have really unintended consequences. So here's an example. Like people thinks I'm gay. What's people? It's a device that records television shows that you pick, and then based on what you pick, it records other shows that it thinks you'll like. You record Star Trek, Tebow assumes you like that kind of thing, and then when you're at home, it records the X-Files. So what's the problem? I had to record Will and Grace, a couple episodes of Ellen, right away the damn thing thinks I'm gay. It keeps recording queer as folk every episode. Last night I recorded a Judy Garland. <laughs> call the company, just tell them you're not gay. I'm gonna beat it when you make that call. Exactly. I actually tried to outfox it, get it to go the other way. I had to record MTV Spring Break, Playboy After Dark, swimsuit competitions, thing won't budge. Insist on getting to problem. So, this, <laughs> this in fact is based on a, a true story. It was a, it's a sitcom, they took it off a blog where this guy was watching. He had a sort of similar situation, but he was trying to watch Western movies, after Western movies, and then they recommended Brokeback Mountain. And so then he wrote, he wrote in this post about, he wrote it, wrote it up. And the post went viral, and it, and every and it, and it was against Netflix, or it actually it was against Tebow at that time, and so they got a bunch of flack about how they're building recommendation systems. And so, expect that your data systems can have really unintended consequences if you don't build it well. Here's the trick: How do you overcome this? Once again, it comes down to what do you want me to take away, what action do you want me to take, and how am I supposed to feel? And if there's any feeling where you may feel intimidated, feel deflated, or any negative context from the user, don't do it. Some of you may have heard about the Target incident, where they sort of, they built all these scores about pregnancy and all this stuff. What a debacle. So easy to avoid. They could have built that in such a robust way that didn't have to be just a pregnancy score. They could have built it as just a general scoring system and other things and ask, like, hey, what happens if the user comes up with this? Just because you can with data doesn't always mean you should. It's a really important thing. Because data is an agreement of trust with your customer. And so let, and trust is consistency over time. If you break that trust, it's hard to gain back. Some of the other things that are there. Please, please, please make sure that you're not using data and insert friction in the system. You ever call an airline, right? And what's the first thing they're doing? They're like, tell me what you like. And this morning I was delayed a bit, so uh, I was like, representative, and they're like, I can't understand you. And you're like, of course you can't understand me, because I'm in line with 30 other people who are angry, yelling at your system, too. And so you sit there, and the systems are super sophisticated, IDR systems, trying to do voice recognition. You sit there, and you're saying, operator, agent, representative, human, just somebody, talk. And then once you get to somebody, after giving all this information, they're like, can you tell me your name again? <laughs> what the system is? This is a data system that has one goal to put friction in the process. 
is there to slow you down. And we see this all the time where people are like trying to get smart, and especially in franchises nowadays where they try to have a system and you're like, here, just press and type and do all this stuff and we'll create a profile. Anything that causes friction, don't do it. Ask yourself, how are you using data to take out friction? Remove friction. Do not add it. A lot of this technology can be great with bank stuff, but take it out. And finally, one of the cool things that I love is, is now what you can do with data on the sales funnel and customer service. On the sales side, what we're seeing is people are using data to figure out how healthy is the, uh, the engagement of the conversation. The company that we're spending a lot of my time with now, Relay IQ, is one of our fortes in building CRM, is to figure out is the customer still relationship still healthy or is it not? The same way with customer service, companies like Zappos, they don't measure a user they don't measure the customer service based on the total time that an agent is on the call with you. They measure on how happy you are, how successful you are. So how do they make the economics work? By putting all of the data in front of the, of the customer service agent at the right time so they can make the best decision. They use all this data to create this very sophisticated environment. It's almost like a heads up display, you can think of it, for this agent to have superpowers so they can do the right thing. And as a result, their net productivity over the entire life cycle of the customer is massive. And when I say massive, I'm not talking 1x, 10, 2x. I'm talking like 100x. It is insane. And if you get a chance to go out to Nevada, you can actually visit the facility out there, and you'll see how sophisticated some of these systems are. So with that, I'm actually just going to jump ahead with uh, what to look for if you're trying to find some of these people on data sciences. If you're trying to find these data people, look for people who are intensely curious. They have a passion for playing with data. They love to work with data. They, this is what they do. But they have this very unique ability to storytell. They're not just the end man. They're the people who make data come alive to help make it actionable. So you really can take advantage of the situation. That, so you can live in this chaotic world, but manage it much more effectively by being data driven. 